Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Us being millennials on our phone, taking pictures. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry you had to see that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, my name is Nina Prevo. And I'm Antonia Okafor. And this is the Trigger Warning 2A podcast. Um, we have a very special guest tonight that will be joining us um, in a little bit here, maybe in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I don't know. Do you want to give the guests a little, or the guests, do you want to give the <laughs> audience a little preview of our guest tonight? Yeah. So uh, especially if you guys keep uh, up to date with Texas politics, uh, we have Matt Rinaldi, former um, Texas state representative, going to join us, strong conservative uh, obviously gun rights, um, also strong on gun rights as well. And he's going to talk about actually what's going on in Texas with the uh, Second Amendment and um, people who claim to be conservative not really pushing um, freedom principles. So <laughs> yeah. to say that lightly. Um, yeah, so we're going to have him on soon. I'm um, mm. really thankful that he's able to join us. He just wrote an article last week that I loved and had to have him on so we could talk more about it. So yeah. Right. And yeah, the situation with the Second Amendment in Texas is actually um, kind of a mess. It's certainly not as secure as you would think, um, given that it's Texas. Um, and we always think of it as sort of a bastion of, you know, Second Amendment rights. But um, especially recently, they've had um, they've had some troubles. And we've talked about that a little bit on this show before. Mm -hmm. But I think that he'll bring a particularly unique perspective. So I'm really excited to talk to him um, in a little bit. But uh, we were going to spend a few minutes just to talk about some of the kind of stuff that's going on in the news cycle right now. Um, so particularly with what's going on with this dude, uh, Nick Fuentes. Oh, yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. Um, Fuentes is, am I wrong? Huh? Is that not Hispanic? <laughs> is he, <laughs> Edgar's nodding. Edgar says okay. yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, um, I have to admit I have been, um, you can probably hear that I'm a little congested. I've been having like the worst allergies ever. So I haven't even been paying t attention to the news as much as I should. But I did manage to still see um, some clips of this dude circulating. And um, what what were some of his quotes? I mean, he was essentially saying things like, like Jim, Jim Crow. Crow and like segregation wasn't that bad. Like, was it really that big of a deal? Yeah, that segregated um, water fountains and all that stuff or... You know, it was best for them. It was best for us. Ew. Oh, my God. You know, you're not white, dude. You're not even white. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess <laughs> by, like, segregation terms, like, unless he was part also, black. Also, oh. um, I just spoke to, oh. to our delegation, mm -hmm. Hispanics, <laughs> and we are not claiming this individual. You, you, so just, I just you disavow, to, <laughs> huh? So he's, okay. he's, he's, he's officially not one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> not well, even a Tejano or anything like that. Latinx? Uh, nope. No. <laughs> Latinx. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Sorry. Nope. 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 We're, we're considering okay. taking his uh, his last name. His last name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was just like, Fuentes. Okay, maybe no. Okay, no. Fuentes. Yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. um, anyways, but I don't know what to think of this guy. I just know he's been trolling. Um, I feel like I've even heard about him for the first time with the whole, didn't he say something um, at one of the Turning Point events with oh, Rob I don't Smith? Know. Um, oh, a gay conservative, and they were bringing up stuff about that, and that's kind of I saw a little bit of that, um, and I feel like shortly after uh, Turning Point was very like adamant, like they are not part of the conservative movement, such and such, mm -hmm. um, and then it's just been he's just basically kind of I don't say blew up because he's not. <laughs> blowing up and sometimes i'm scared to even talk about this because i feel like sometimes we make him or make them more of a big deal than yeah. what they really are um so yeah i always try to there's and a I, line between that i think and yeah. I, I and that's a reasonable concern i mean obviously it's kind of um you don't want to talk about that issue too too much because it does you know it highlights them it's like you know you don't want to give them more fame or like unnecessary um, free press, right. so to speak. But at the same time, like some of these opinions are just so bad that I think when they're put out there, um, you know, 
uh, the light is the best way to sterilize bad ideas. So we can talk right. about how um, stupid some of that stuff was that he said. Um, because really, segregation was a really big deal. You know, to say that is just coming from such a, a lack of understanding of the historical context. I mean, it was just... It's obviously slavery is like a really dark part of American history, but the whole Jim Crow era is also a stain on our history as a country. Like to pretend that people were just kind of overreacting about that is really, um, I don't know. That's just so historically idiotic. Like I just can't. Um, And I'm not sure who is going to be impressed by statements like that or who he's even trying to play to with that because I don't think that I don't think that the average um, Caucasian individual would even uh, agree with that sentiment um, well, these days. I think the big thing now, the reason why he is getting such um, a lot more credibility, is because there is a prominent conservative, Michelle Malkin, who has been um, actively supporting him and um, using it as a whole. Well, it's you know he's not mainstream, and so people are trying to go against him because mm-hmm. he's not mainstream. Let's just clear the air right now um if it's mainstream (laughs) to not tolerate racism (laughs) then i'm establishment because (laughs) um that's something that no one should be tolerating and um there's definitely things that we've seen especially on the right i mean they how many times have we said things that they say that are anti-black or that you know, are mm-hmm. racist to like to me or to to Nina, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because we, we uh, don't agree on like entitlements are a good thing and stuff like that. I mean, the type of stuff that because we be- believe in a certain type of policy or don't agree with a certain type of policy that people have tried to equate to being black or not black or racist or not racist has Mm. been absurd but there are definitely clear lines in the sand where people all around can unify under the fact that okay that's racism and that's not tolerance yeah so well and i think that there's a big difference between saying like because i don't i don't know if if uh this fuentes dude has been facing like getting canceled so to speak or like if he's uh facing losing a job or something like that there's one thing to say someone should be able to say whatever they think you know and you shouldn't be silencing them or censoring them or something versus saying oh the only reason why they're going after or why anyone's going after this guy is because you know he's um he's like alternative media or something or you know he's he's not establishment media and that's why they're trying to Mm -hmm. paint him in a negative light but realistically you know he he said some some outrageous things that i think um would be considered racist uh you know by by most people like not just not just the people who are like trying to say everything's racist but you know by the basic understanding of what racism is which is that you're gonna judge people by their skin color in a negative way and or assert that you know we should be separate or we should be separating ourselves on the basis of our race in society and that, you know, that it was better for us to do. I mean, that, that is just, that is just despicable, like shame on him. Yeah. And so this is also why I don't want to give him, of course, we've been saying that the whole time, but this is why I just, (laughs) I saw this last night and I was just like, okay, this is exactly his game plan. Um, This is from the Hill. Uh, So he said that some of his remarks are meant as outrage trolling to draw attention to his show (laughs) or as over-the-top digs at political rivals aimed at getting under their skin. Quote, that's kind of the whole thing, he said. Quote, we have figured out the game, the algorithm. We've hacked the conversation where if you say sensational things like we do, you get attention. True. I don't want it to be like that. I wish I could ascend with ideas. Like, it was almost like he's trolling himself in that one. (laughs) I don't know. So, anyways. (laughs) Well, and the thing is... um, you know, if I just don't, I just don't buy that one bit. Um, you don't buy what he just said in there. I don't buy that it was just a joke, you know, or that mm. it's like, oh, you know, I'm only saying this to trigger people. Because the t- truth be told, it's really easy to trigger the left. You don't, That's you don't true. have to, you don't have to go out and be like. I mean, but wasn't Jim Crow actually a good thing, though? Like, that's that's really (laughs) all you have to do is just go out there and like um, uh, with my pen name, I I said something along the lines of um, like only women can get pregnant. And I mean, I 
like Twitter exploded on that, you know? So you don't, you don't have to go <laughs> and be, you know, saying crazy, like racist things to get a rise out of people. I just don't think that, um, I don't think it's worth it. So, um, yeah, Nick Fuentes, I disavow, I disavow <laughs> anyone on the all right. <laughs> I am just over it. I'm, I'm sick of, I'm sick of this idea that, um, or I'm, I don't know. I'm sorry I'm on a rant, but it really bothers me that we have been able to completely undo sort of the teachings of Martin Luther King in what, like, just, you know, a couple decades here, like four or five decades. Like, it's just, you know, the whole idea that content of character should matter more than skin tone. It's like both sides are just throwing that out the window, at least in their extremist wings. Um, and like you said, Michelle Malkin came out who, you know, I actually like, some of her journalism I actually really appreciate, but the idea that we're not going to like disavow our extremists on either side and we're going to let people just keep perpetuating this idea that the races like can't get along is crazy to me. Oh, I guess that's our guest. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that's, that's my, um, that's my one rant about that because we got to, we got to clean up on both of our sides. We can't just say, oh, well, because he's a quote unquote conservative voice, we're going to not, you know, be critical of the things that he says when he says stuff that is um, blatantly racist like that. Right. So, right. And Anyways. Yeah, our, yeah. Our guest is here. I don't know if he can hear us. Yes, I can. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? We can't hear him. This one. Oh, yeah, we can. Oh, I was going to say I could Edgar, hear him. Edgar, we can. We can hear about you. Yeah, no, we can hear him, but the audience probably couldn't hear him. Uh, oh, <laughs> hey, okay. I guess them. <laughs> um, well, here, do you want Yeah, to- yeah. Okay, before, I wanted to say Mr. Rinaldi or Matt or... Okay, but is after you're in office, is it the honorable? Like, is it honorable? What is What is the proper... <laughs> No, I'm, I'm dishonorable you. now. Dishonorable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, um, former so, state representative. Former state. Or Matt. Okay, all right. Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool. Like, I feel like I've known you for a while now. Like, and you know, you're like, no, still respect me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you so much for uh, joining us. You told me, you guys, you said that you just came from a hockey game practice. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't know if I'd make it. We went into overtime. So I oh, okay. All right. Sped so over good. here. Well, you're you're welcome. We're always late, anyways. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it works. We'll act like it. We did it on purpose. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so you know, I of course a native Texan. I'm I'm sad that I'm you know I'm, well I shouldn't say I'm sad in Colorado, but I'm <laughs> sad that I'm in Colorado because I'm a native Texan. I love Texas. I miss Texas. Obviously, I've been keeping um, up to date about what's going on in Texas and. Some good stuff, but a lot of bad stuff. And I came across your article um, that you wrote for Empowered Texans, I believe, and uh, yep. talking about what's going on in Texas with the gun control uh, com- conversation. Um, can you can you kind of fill in the people who don't know what's going on in Texas with that? I'm um, a little bit like what's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I wrote a couple articles because what's happened since session's been over has been very troubling. Um, basically, what's happened is we had a session with basically no significant uh, victories on second nights. And this is Texas, where we have won every statewide office since 1994, mm. and we hold both houses of the legislature. And we couldn't pass constitutional carry. We're not one of the 33 states that have unlicensed carry of some sort. We're not one of the 15 concealed uh, uh, constitutional carry states. Um, And to be honest, I I don't think we're very close to passing it right now Mm -hmm. uh, with the current makeup of the legislature. So so that's troubling enough. But since the uh, session has been over, uh, since the shootings in Odessa and El Paso, uh, our leadership, namely Dan Patrick, and to a lesser extent, but still Greg Abbott, um, has been on a gun control crusade, and we've been going the wrong direction. So what's happened is effectively Greg Abbott, uh, the big three, Greg Abbott, Dennis mm-hmm. Bonin, uh, Dan Patrick, have started these uh, uh, mass violence uh, hearings uh, with a special legislative committee and a special Senate committee. And they've been basically traveling in the state, mostly to swing districts, talking about gun control and what to implement. And the lieutenant governor has been pushing extremely hard 
universal background checks, which are, as you know, are effectively a universal gun registry. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. So we're, we're, we should be on offense. People think Texas Second Amendment rights, and that's just not the case with our Republican leadership right now, but it should be. Right. Absolutely. So um, what do you think is motivating them to do this? Um, I, I think, I think, I mean, I think fear, to be honest with you. Um, I think they were afraid of the election results last time and they think they're, you know, somehow parrying the Democrats latest assault on second amendment rights. But we all, we all know that's not the way you do it. They take a little bit. They always go for more. Right. Um, and it just isn't enacting bad policy is never a good idea. Right. Right. Yeah. And it just seems like, yeah, like you're saying that we're always almost on the defenses, even, even though, which is crazy. I mean, that's why, you know, you, you uh, lovingly referred it as the purple session, right? You know, right? It was us trying yeah. to be moderate and us trying to win the middle, which is, you know, like you said in, in the article, it doesn't really exist. That's not how you actually win um, people in the middle. Um, but even outside of that, it's, okay, this is Texas. We have the Senate. We have the, you know, Republicans have the Senate. They, they have the House. Then why are we not pushing? I mean, we look at the left and they do such a great job <laughs> of never compromising when it comes to their beliefs and not being, you know, sorry, not sorry, right? Like they, they don't care if you're upset with it. Um, but for some reason we have both, we have control of both uh, chambers, but yet we are trying to to uh, go in the middle. Why do you think that it's that way? Well, like I said, again, fear. I think they, that our elected officials at a statewide level are listening, first of all, listening to bad advice from political consultants right. who, who frankly don't know what they're talking about. Um, and they're telling them, oh, you got to appeal to the middle. But like with the Nate Silver piece that I cited mm -hmm. in the article I wrote, there is no middle of that sort. Right. Uh, there's, there's people who switch parties. They might vote Democrat sometime. They might vote Republican. But they're not looking at issues and picking a middle ground on each particular issue. Right. Uh, sometimes they're extreme on individual issues. And sometimes they're not interested in issues at all and might vote when they see their friends very excited about a candidate. And we saw that with Beto, right? Mm -hmm. People voted or never voted before because they got caught up in the excitement. Right. Mm -hmm. Moderation and bad policy don't create excitement. Right, <laughs> they exactly. Don't. They don't. They especially don't on our side and, not, and for the base. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, and a lot of this, you said the big three, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, Patrick, Bonin, um, we actually... I. I don't know, Nina, if you remember Bonin. We early <laughs> on in our uh, podcast, we talked about him very mm -hmm. uh, early on, um, and then we and then we have uh, Abbott. And so, I mean, I know there's people have different ideas about all of them. Bonin, though, I think we have a united voice um, that we are for the most part very um, excited that he's stepping down, um, <laughs> <laughs> that he's at least taken that much of of action, um, but. I mean, constitutional carry, I believe, did not pass because of Bonin. Uh, essentially, his leadership and the people that he put in place in the committees, I mean, it was, it looked strategic, you know. Um, I know there's people who are not as uh, optimistic about who's going to replace him in the future. Um, but what do, we, what do you think we really need to do? Because it doesn't seem like, I mean, when Dan Patrick is saying things like this, it just doesn't seem like there's a, really a fear say the fear of God, but uh, in a way, you know, the people are supposed to be um, th their accountability. So what is really going to change their minds when it comes to, you know, the next session coming up um, to, to go back the way of the conservative? They need to be afraid of not passing. Uh, right. they, they need to be more afraid of us than they are of the lobbyists in Austin. Mm. Um, and, and that's what we need to do. Um, and, and we need to, by the way, we, I disagree that Bonin was the, the roadblock. He was a roadblock, okay. obviously. Um, but I worked with these guys and I can tell you, these people have no idea what constitutional care even is. Mm. They have no idea how many states have enacted it. They have no idea. This is a mainstream policy in the United yeah. States right now right. that we're falling behind. I mean, states like Missouri have enacted 
constitutional carry. <laughs> Missouri is, is not a, a, a bright red state, no. certainly not as much as Texas is. Right. So, you know, I think we have to educate them a lot in order to get the reps to support this policy. And the second thing is, I think we need to educate them that the Second Amendment's an issue. You know, we put up with a lot from our Republican representatives of the past and our Republican elected officials. Uh, they compromise far more than, than I'd like to see them compromise. However, guns pro-life issues, those have always been untouchable. And, you know, we see them now building a brand that these are things that are not necessarily off the table. Yeah. And I think that in the long run, that's a mistake for Republican lawmakers that want to get reelected. I don't think that they real like you say that they're not fearing the right thing. And I think that you're right. I mean, I'm not sure what they're scared of. Are they scared of the people who weren't going to vote for them anyway, not voting for them? Or I guess the idea is that um, now gun control is a moderate policy, which I kind of disagree with, actually. I don't think that that actually is going moderate. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a a pretty far left policy. Even uh, within Democrats, there's a lot of people who still don't want um, more gun control. So, um, I don't know. Uh, d- wh- what do you think about um, how conservatives in Texas are responding to mm. um, what the legislature is doing? Are they happy about these, you know, more purple kind of policies, or are they, you know, are they kind of upset that the Republicans seem to be um, not really sticking to their guns? There you yeah. go for a pun. There you go. I, <laughs> I think they're very upset when they find out about it. I, I don't think they realize how far behind we're getting on Second Amendment rights issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they hear about it, they're, they're very upset. And I think this latest gun control push by Dan Patrick has gotten them really fired up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think they're just sick about it because it is such a big concession to start talking about universal background checks. Right. Because what you're talking about is tracking every gun purchase in the United States with forms that you keep on file for 20 years or have to provide to the ATF. So effectively, one subpoena away, one rule away is a universal background registry. And we all know that, you know, other Democrats, they want to take our guns. And this Mm -hmm. is the first step. This is the biggest barrier right now to their plan. And Dan Patrick wants to remove it. It was the imagery of when you, in your article, where you said, that if you left Texas and you kept going on a road trip all the way to Canada, that you would mm-hmm. be crossing states that had permitless carry, had constitutional carry. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh, you had to leave Texas and then go to Canada. <laughs> yeah, you have to leave I mean, Texas <laughs> to get to constitutional carry. Yeah, I carry. know, I know. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I don't know, Oklahoma just, you know, had theirs. A lot of people are attributing what happened uh, in the, the Walmart parking lot to a uh, um, uh, what I've heard oh. lately is because of a man that was able to, you know, essentially get the guy to eventually um, end his own life um, instead of mm-hmm. continuing to pursue other people's lives uh, because he was a good guy with a gun. Right. Um, he was a hero. Right. And here in, in Texas, in Sutherland Springs as absolutely, well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with a, a good guy with a gun and, and so many other places as well. I mean, back back 20 years, I mean, you still saw. Uh, Pearl, Mississippi school shooting, Appalachian uh, uh, law school uh, uh, shooting as well. I mean, you had people, good guys with guns stopping bad guys with guns. In both those instances, they had to go out to the car to go get the guns because they weren't allowed inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, but we see it time after time. We, 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 I mean, it, it's estimated to have 500,000 to 2 million defensive gun right. uses per year. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's compared to 10,000 homicides with guns. I mean, it's staggering. So tell me a little bit more about um, about this legislation that they might have been trying to pass or might be thinking about passing in the future. Mm -hmm. You were talking about universal background checks. And normally when I hear that, I think of a national gun registry or something like that. But we're talking about a Texas legislature. So were they wanting to essentially have that kind of requirement, but just within the state of Texas? Or what What? What were they actually entertaining here? Because it well, sounds kind of crazy to me. <laughs> well, so. that, that's effectively what you'd be doing. Right now, um, it's unclear what they're talking about um, mm-hmm. because what the governor's proposed is a, a system of voluntary background checks and incentivizing those voluntary background checks. Hmm. So okay. right now, 
we do have voluntary background checks for private sales. If I sold a gun to you in the state of Texas, we could just go to the gun store and have them fill out the forms and do it voluntarily. And then we pay them about 45 bucks and they, they file the forms and we do it like a, a, a normal sale. Yeah. No one's preventing uh, you background. from doing a background check sure. on anyone that you sell anything <laughs> right. to really. Yeah. Right. So we don't need a law to have voluntary background checks. Like the governor said, mm-hmm. what I think the Lieutenant governor is talking about is mandatory background checks. Mm-hmm. So when you look at those two things, what I think the governor is going to propose that is consistent with his plan and is effectively a mandatory background check is he's going to try to impose civil liability. If a gun is sold in a private sale without a background check and subsequently used in the crime. So if, Mm. if I'm going to take your house and everything you own, if you know, the guy you sell a gun to somehow does something with it later, that really isn't very voluntary. Right. Right. (laughs) I mean, it's not a voluntary background check. So what we're talking about is mandatory background checks, effectively a gun registry for Texas gun owners. If this goes through. Wow. Oh my goodness. And that's why I have you on. So cuz people yeah. don't believe me. They don't oh no, Texas, there's no way. Uh-huh, I'm going to be moving over there. I'm like, you guys need to know the truth. Which by the way, I've been saying this for years. Texas is way behind. Uh-huh. Way behind. Matt just he's yeah, these Coloradans they like to make fun of us. So I um, mean, <laughs> we're not we're not doing great ourselves right now no, with some of this all. stuff. So But I do like to make fun of you guys. <laughs> And remind you guys that the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame is in Colorado. That's right. Uh, I don't know why that matters. I, I don't know why that matters, but but it does. It bothers I, Texas. I moved. Uh, I moved from Connecticut about eighteen years ago, mm. and it was easier to get my gun permit there than it was in Texas. Oh. Really? Ooh. Ooh, yep. That's that's a burn on <laughs> Texas for sure. I've been saying it. <laughs> I wonder if that's the same case with Massachusetts though, because when I looked into getting a license in Massachusetts, oh, it seemed like no, it was Massachusetts pretty crazy. is a little rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't even have a spent shell in your car. Yeah, um, actually, um, th- there was a there was a, a crime spree in our neighborhood, and some of the women wanted to get um, get mace. Mm-hmm. And mace is oh, yeah. considered a firearm in Massachusetts, okay. so you actually need a gun permit to get mace. Yeah, I like uh, pepper spray. Yeah, I was told that I um I couldn't carry pepper spray walking around in Boston when I lived there. I don't know if they've changed that or not, but no, um, it's still considered no. a dangerous yeah. weapon. Yeah, and know. I was like, oh yeah, that's you guys really care about your uh, women walking around at night by themselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, that seems that seems pretty crazy to me. I'm surprised that um that that it's the Republicans who are kind of even, I don't know, that they would even entertain um, legislation like that. Well, because uh, yeah. once you have a list like that, you know, that, that gets used negatively or it just, it just leaves the potential for abuse um, right there on the table. So I'm pretty shocked to hear about this. Yeah. And what I've seen, the trend I've been seeing is for me, the word the term conservative has always been that really the big definer right between like a republican right and then a conservative i think principled i think this person um knows you know the actual you know platform for one of a republican party the conservative the republican party should be a conservative party um unfortunately we have not seen that and what i've really been seeing is you know we talk about rhinos all the time in texas right because there's so many republicans i mean you just have to be republican in order to to win sometimes um and so we do see that as an aftermath but now i'm starting to see um and i saw someone else use the term too uh conservatives in, in name only and i think dan patrick almost might be a prominent example of that how what is it going to be the how are we going to differentiate between the, those who are actually you know conservatives and principled and and you know we can actually trust with our our vote um in the future especially in the next session and people you know voting people in um what is that going to look like you know i have a different view on it after being in government uh i don't think you're looking for the perfect people uh, I think you just need a few. Um, I mean, truly, when, when we had a, we had one of the most conservative sessions we've ever had, my last session in the legislature, and 12 people in the House of Representatives uh, controlled, uh, you know, virtually every big ticket item that came through and made so much of a difference. Really, 
you know, a, a lot of the people are just trying to protect themselves. And the more you can bring to light, the more you force them to do the right thing. And I don't care why they do the right thing. I just, <laughs> I, I just want them to do the right thing. Um, so you just need a few brave people to put their colleagues to some uncomfortable choices and shed light on what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think any of this has to do with an influx of, um, mm. the key I shouldn't question. say, I, already know. <laughs> I shouldn't even phrase it like this. I was going to say uh, refugees <laughs> from California, um, but uh, an influx of people migrating, I suppose, from California or from the coasts to Texas. Um, do you think that the legislature is trying to pander to some of their new mm. um, citizenry in Texas or... Because I, um, a lot of people that um, are in Texas, I, or I, at least here in Colorado, I feel people coming in from right. the coast a lot. And it's certainly yeah. affecting our politics. So I'm just wondering if you think that that's playing a role in Texas, too. I think they're coming to Colorado for different reasons, though. I mean, Texas, you know, doesn't have the mountains. It doesn't have the skiing. <laughs> um, you guys that's have right. very interesting marijuana <laughs> laws. Uh, okay. So people might be coming in for... Uh, for different reasons. Here in Texas, I think what we see is a lot of political relocations. I, I'm one of them. Mm. Uh, I had no ties to Texas before I moved here. I moved from Connecticut. Right. Um, I'm basically a political refugee. <laughs> um, and I think you see a lot of them. There, there was a 2012 Texas, um, University of Texas poll, I think it was Texas Tribune poll, um, a, a series of them that asked people who moved from California, what political party are you? And it came out to be like 59% Republican, 27% Democrat. It was like almost two to one. So I think you saw people relocating based on politics. And, you know, we saw that in the Beto numbers. The exit polls showed that Beto won native Texans. Mm -hmm. Ted yeah. Cruz won transplants. Right. I saw Weird. that. And a lot of people got, yep, a lot of people were like, no way. There's no hmm. way. What's going on, Texas? And like, yeah, they're refugees. <laughs> you know, it, you know it, it's people try to explain this stuff and it's so difficult it's almost like you know explaining the economy and how it works perfectly you, you, you just can't right it's too complicated i mean you have millions of people and millions of different views mm -hmm. and some of it doesn't make sense and you try to make sense of it but you can't so what do you need to do well Stop trying to predict what they think and be a leader. Right. Exactly. You know, stand up for truth and stand up what you for what you believe and change views. Right. I mean, yeah. I think the Second Amendment's doing pretty well, considering that even the Republicans are basically speaking against it. I and know. nobody's standing up right now. Yeah, considering yet, <laughs> it's actually. But kind yet of you do a poll, and over in a plurality of people, at least, and some a majority, want the gun laws to stay the same. Well, I mean, that, think if Dan Patrick was doing a road, uh, a, a tour advocating for constitutional carry. What would the polls be that? Right. I mean. So I've, I've got a, a question for you and maybe more of a comment, but it's still a question. Mm -hmm. And you being somebody who left your, your state for political reasons, mm -hmm. uh, this is something that we've been arguing for a very long time. We argued it in 2013 when Colorado was going through their transition mm -hmm. from being a very purple state which most coloradans kind of appreciate just yeah, independent like leave us alone type of stuff mm -hmm. to all of a sudden starting to sway very left a lot of people are like ah, i gotta leave it's like okay well that's what california did they left and yeah. and there was nobody left to fight yeah and then that, that's what we're doing colorado we're leaving then there's nobody here to fight anymore so at what point do we stop running Mm -hmm. And do we just fight in our state? And I'm not running, so. Yeah, well, my state was also very cold and rainy and cloudy all the time. So. <laughs> I was fine running there. No, I, I, you know, that's a very good point. I mean, eventually you have to, to pick a place to make home and you got to fight for it. I mean, it, it's absolutely true. And, you know, eventually there's going to be no place to run to. So yeah. you know, that's why it's so important that we make a stand now here in Texas, especially um, in Colorado, where you all are uh, everywhere. I mean, I, you feel our society slipping away from us and it's so close and so much has changed over the last five years. Um, I mean, I don't know what what my my son's going to have to deal with 10 years from now. I know. I think about that, too, just um, 
even since I graduated from law school, which was in 2015, the culture and the political sphere has just changed so much. And that's only four years, you know, it's, right. it's like um, night and day in terms of how, how tense things are and how um, extreme um, both sides have kind of gotten, or at least there's wings of both sides that have gone super extreme. So well, it, but we can change it back. Right. You know, that, that that's one of the, the benefits I have of, being really like a lot older, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> is, you know, I, I saw it swing this way too from where it was before. I remember when I was in law school in 2000, our uh, argument for, you know, moot court competition was Heller, basically. Mm. Oh, interesting. And I had the, the pro Second Amendment side and we ended up winning. And I remember my law professor telling me, you know, straight faced, and I'm like, yep, you know, no court will ever find what you had to argue. Oh, and then our Supreme yeah. Court pretty much did that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was about seven years later. So a lot changed in seven years. And you know what? When he said it to me, I really didn't argue with him too much because he basically was right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or it seemed right. So a lot changed in seven years. Uh, we can change it back. You guys yeah. are both, I think, Boston University alum, too. Oh, did you go to yes. BU Law? Yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> that's my alma mater uh, for law school, too. So um, it is really oh, wow. amazing. Where, when did you graduate? Uh, 2015. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, Who was your com law professor? Um, professor Lahav. I'm sure that she won't wow. be happy that I am the product of her constitutional law class because All right, she... I had uh, Larry, Larry Yakel was the one who said that oh, to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, I ended up having to... I think she could tell I had some libertarian leanings. Um, and so she made me get up and have the anti-gay marriage position in a debate in front of our whole right. class. I didn't get to choose which position I had, but she's like, you seem like you can defend some kind of extreme views. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to give you this. I was like, great. This uh, people are going to love me after um after I make this argument. Um <laughs> so well, I got to be there when Randy Barnett was still there, so we had the oh, libertarians man. were well represented. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it was um yeah, we we were we were few and far between by the time I got there, but I think that that's yeah. partially just because of how far left Boston has moved. I mean, um, oh, yeah. and and also just how far left university faculty has moved because such a large percentage of our faculty um, was really of the of the belief of the living constitution. You know, they right. they talked about originalism like it was some outdated kind of, you know, archaic way to look at the constitution. But I always thought that that really was just saying that it means what it says. Um, and so anyway, um, sorry, Antonio, we went off on kind of a law school. <laughs> I knew you had to remember this um, about stuff like um, that. It's okay. But yeah, but, <laughs> and you still, you had to be in that terrible tower that I was in too, right? The, the law school oh, tower. The, uh... Yeah, the 70s building. Yeah, the, the tribute to brutalist architecture that they can't even yeah, get rid of because the awful. state made it um, like a, I don't know, some kind of historical landmark <laughs> or something. And it's hideous. It's the ugliest building on BU's campus. Yeah. Um, and they can't get rid of it. They would love to, but they can't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I had another question. <laughs> Um, but thinking about BU, I got off on all these thoughts about Constitu <laughs> Oh, oh, I was going to say, um, it's interesting that you talk about the Heller decision because not only did they do Heller with the mm -hmm. McDonald case, they mm -hmm. actually doubled down on it and made the second amendment just as important as all of the other amendments that, you know, shine onto the states and force the states to abide by them as well. So our Supreme Court really did a, a pretty good job, actually, of protecting yep. um, the Second Amendment. I wish that our Congress and, um, you know, some of our state legislatures could do um, a little bit of a better job. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, you see, you see society in so many ways slipping away from us. And the Second Amendment and pro-life issues, I think we've been winning the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I do think the pro-life issue was one where the um, while while certain Democrats have gone completely off the deep end with it and are just super extreme with it. I think the general Overton window of where people fall in oh, terms yeah. of um, abortion issues has gone much more toward pro-life culturally. I right. think. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I mean, think in 1996, you didn't have a single major Republican presidential contender that wasn't 
in favor of abortion, at least for the first trimester. Wow. wow. I didn't know that. Well, you think of it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think if Gary Bauer was in that election, but I don't think it was. He was first and foremost like one of the contenders. But yeah, even Fred Thompson was first trimester. That was something you had to concede at the time. And I, I mean, I remember that it was, it was like hey, first trimester. And now that just isn't the case. The window has moved. Mm -hmm. Second Amendment issues. Concealed carry was in maybe eight states in the yeah. late '80s. Right. Uh, and when I was in college, it was unthinkable. Um, we were talking about, the talk in college was about banning guns. Not, not rifles, all guns, mm. handguns, everything. Yeah. Um, Yikes. And that was within the realm of you know, normal discussion. Now it's not. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we are making progress. Right. Which is good. Um, and I remembered my question. Yep. Um, so as someone who was in a state legislature, what can the average person do to try to help, you know, sway someone like you to maybe, you know, um, implement more Second Amendment friendly policies or libertarian policies, conservative policies, whatever they're looking for? How how should we approach um, our legislature and what actually works in terms of mm. um, swaying opinions? You know, talk, talk to them, uh, write them, call them. Um, you know, address them on social media. They pay attention to that. But if you really want to have more sway than, you know, the average person, I can tell you that every single one of the state legislators in Texas has a district with about 170,000 people. Mm -hmm. They know every influencer in their district that votes in Republican primaries and influences more than 20 people. I mean, wow, I, I wow. just do every single person. So you know what you do? Meet everybody in your neighborhood. Talk to people who don't really, you know, have an interest in politics. Mm -hmm. Become an influencer, and they will listen to you. Interesting. Um, yeah. Do do state uh, legislators actually read the emails that you send to their like uh, account on their <laughs> website? You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they more or less count them. Okay. However, if it's from one of the influencers that I'm talking right. about, they, they will read them. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. 20 people. Absolutely. I know. Um, but people I, I mean, really I'm, don't understand how much influence they ha can have, especially mm -hmm. on the state level. I mean, and then also on, on the municipal level. Like, yeah. Come on. Like, even way more than even that. Um, and speaking of state reps that uh, understood <laughs> people um, of influence, um, Ali Stuckey, uh, I was just listening to her amazing um, testimony on Capitol Hill. Uh, man, she was literally one of five. Uh, wow. One, well, she was the only one who was actually pro life. Everybody else was obviously anti life. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, they were just brutal to her. Um, but it's just been really great to see other people like that, like Allie. And, um, you know, it was, it was really it was really sad to see that her dad was, you know, kicked out of office and, and like that wave that happened, um, you know, in November. And so. What do you think it's going to take? And I don't know where everybody is, where everyone stands on. I don't even know if you're going to run again or, or whatever. But um, what do you think is going to be the next shift? Like, do you are you do you see promising people um, who might be able to at least take back those those places that were um, where the conservatives were kicked out, like Connie Burton's, you know, seat, like um, uh, like. No, I'm forgetting his name. Oh my goodness! I think about Stucky, so I think a uh, Stucky's I'm dad. <laughs> that's yeah, it's that's definitely your married oh, enough. Simmons. Yeah, Simmons. I'm like yeah, Allie's dad. Um, and then and even like you, but you were. I mean, you're an Irving, and I understand that people who don't know Irving, Irving was such a. I mean, I'm even more so than before a swing district. But yeah, what is it going to take for those people to get that those seats back? Um, I think it's going to. I mean, it's going to take a lot of work. Mm -hmm. First of all. Um, and I think a lot of it's going to have to uh, do with the presidential election, uh, what issues come up, how crazy the Democratic candidate is. Right. <laughs> um, but what I think it's going to have to do is it's going to it's going to have a lot to do with building a Republican brand around issues that people care about. Now, look at Georgia. Um, 
Georgia has seen a huge shift in popularity for the governor who won by less than you know Greg Abbott did. I mean, he won by a couple of points. But what did he do? He passed a heartbeat bill. He passed bold legislation and, you know, didn't shy away from the tough issues. And people responded. Mm-hmm. I mean, his 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 approval rating soared. Right. But here in Texas, we think there's a different formula. We have to avoid the controversial issues. No, people people appreciate people who go into office and do something. Right. Um, and, and a lot of people's minds aren't made up on a lot of these issues. Um, they have a team they might like or not like. But, you know, when we would poll, you know, gun issues, they would poll very well, even, even among Democrats. We would poll life issues. Um, Democrats in our polls would favor defunding Planned Parenthood. Wow. So... We have the high ground on a lot. And by the way, that, that Hispanics were 71 to nothing um, pro-life. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I the people see that. we're trying to get don't care about these. You know, they're very important, but don't care about fiscal issues. They care about these important hot button Cultural controversial issues. issues. Mm-hmm. People don't want to. Yeah, exactly. That people don't want to touch. Right. Well, for the longest time, I remember like right when I got into the Republican Party of People talking in the Republican Party. Oh, we need to stop. We need to focus on the fiscal issues. We need to stop talking about the social issue, um, the fiscal issues, not on the social issues. You know, and so it was like. Oh. Ironically, those those are the issues they get the maddest about. Right, right? exactly. They try to take it's away their crazy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So there is a lot of, like you were saying before, there's a lot of bad, um, you know, strategists and people just talking out of. Uh, they're 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 heinies. Um, so we <laughs> yeah. have a question from the audience, uh, the honest Jew. Uh, question for Matt: How can left leaning areas, New Jersey, California, New York City, have such dr- draconian gun laws, especially in lieu of legal? And I think it's in light of in light of legal le- landmarks. Yeah, I think in essence they're saying. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Like how can how can um, really deep blue states pass draconian gun laws given that Heller's on the books. And I have ideas on that, but they specifically asked you, Matt, so. <laughs> well, you can tell me if I'm right after <laughs> I answer. Uh, I mean, I don't know about that. <laughs> trust Matt, don't trust me. <laughs> no, I, I, you, you know, it, it, it's not really a developed area of jurisprudence right now, and the Supreme Court has, you know, they established those two precedents but haven't really, you know, given a lot of guidance and are kind of waiting for the circuit court jurisprudence to play out and for there to develop uh, circuit splits that then they will, you know, weigh in on that little issue as well. So they're kind of guiding things, but they're not, you know, they're not establishing the, the whole realm right now. All that we know is we know that you can't ban guns. Right. Um, there's starting to become a development of jurisprudence that you can't really ban concealed carry. Mm-hmm. Uh, that really doesn't affect much because no state ba- completely bans guns. And as far as concealed carry, I, 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 49 or 50 states, I think now are shall issue. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that hasn't been an issue because we've been doing so well in the state legislatures. But I, I think you'll get a lot of states now with New Jersey's new laws and Connecticut's new laws. I think you'll see some new challenges mm-hmm. and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you're right about that. Because um, <laughs> in essence, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not just as though a law gets passed and then the Supreme Court can be like, hey, <laughs> that violates the Constitution and we're striking it down. Like it actually it has to get challenged and go up the ranks of the various federal courts. And then even then, the Supreme Court still might not take on a case that actually gets to their level because there might not be, a sp- like you said, a split between the circuits where they're actually having to decide um, a dispute between different circuits throughout the country. So um, until those cases actually get up to the Supreme Court, they can't, um, you know, strike down any laws. And so that's kind of where... But where it is. there's been some there, there has been some that have been struck down mm-hmm. like uh, and, and I don't know if they still are or not. But at least for a time, Puerto Rico was a constitutional carry state because their gun laws got struck down. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And when all of them get struck down, then what you're left with is a constitutional carry state. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, that's kind of it just it takes a long time for that stuff to um 
to get worked out. And yeah, it's a very, when I was going through law school, um, we were talking about Heller and McDonald because it was such a new area of jurisprudence. And constitutionally speaking, the Second Amendment hadn't really been litigated in the Supreme Court mm -hmm. for a long time, mm -hmm. which I actually think is indicative of where our culture is because it had been such a safe, you know, um, part of the Bill of Rights for so long. And now all of a sudden it's being litigated again because it actually is being challenged at a certain level um, in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. right. Um, right. And that's just kind of my analysis of why that popped up in the Supreme Court at all. Um, that's it. Yeah, there were no cases from 1931, was 1937? Yeah, that sounds about I forgot right. which one it was. It had been a 1937 really or whatever to... 2007, 2008. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, nothing. Yeah. And then, of course, Washington, D.C., they try to ban handguns, <laughs> and then bam, we're, we're, the Supreme Court has to um, deal with the Second Amendment question because uh, that's pretty much uh, what Heller was about. Um, right. But uh, let's see. And if anyone else has questions um, in the chat, we're, we're open to them. I think there were at least some comments that you might want to um, comment on. Uh, 42 Chilb says, um, many people don't fall into either party, even though they call themselves X, Y, Z. But um, if you cannot defend your rights, do you really have rights? Hmm. It's a kind of a complicated statement. But I, I think I understand what they're saying, which is that um, people might not be defining themselves as Republican or Democrat or whatever, but what they care about is having someone elected that actually will defend their rights. And if you can't do that, then, you know, why are you in office? Um, right. do you think that, um, these Republicans are in any trouble of getting the boot, uh, for some of, for some of this stuff? I, I, I do. I mean, I think, Name I names, think they've man. opened themselves <laughs> up to, pri I think a lot of them have opened themselves up to primary challenges. Right. Um, and I think in Texas, we've been fairly, um, we've shown the willingness to kick out people who aren't doing what they said they were going to do. I mean, I, I wanted a primary challenge against the sitting Republican house rep. A bunch of my colleagues did as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the voters are ready to kick out reps that don't do what they said they're going to do in office. Yeah. I do think a lot of voters are pretty fed up, especially like not just in Texas, but on the federal level too, with sending people who say that they care about, um, you know, not just conservative issues, but specifically the Second Amendment issue, and then they get in office and they just don't, they just don't live up to what they said they were going to do. Yeah. yeah, it's been really interesting to move from Texas to here and like how politics works here, and you know, just really seeing the you know people voting conservative on when it comes to you know like pop propositions and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then literally doing <laughs> cognitive dissonance of. Oh, oh well, I'm going to vote for, like, leftist-leaning, you know, Democrat socialists. Like, of yeah. course, it's going to gonna totally go for the type of stuff that I believe in. So, um, yeah, it's been interesting to see that as well, and hopefully that never comes. <laughs> I don't know if you saw how our elections went in 2016, Matt, but it was um, pretty much all of our policy, um, you know, things that we could vote on, they all went sort of in a conservative or at least sort of libertarian leaning way. Right. But then we elected the most blue Democrat government that we've had since like, like the twenties or so. It was crazy. It was like almost a hundred years since we've had a government this um, heavily controlled by Democrats. But that's, that's what keeps happening. What the voters want in terms of policy, they're not, they're not reflecting in who they're putting in office. And, um, no. yeah. And, and it's funny because even during the primaries, uh, my, me and my political consultant will talk before and we'll try to call all the races. And my theory has always been the more likable person is going to win the race, given the same amount of money, no matter what mm -hmm. issues there are. Yeah. And we would sit, we'd say, you know, we'd argue over who's more likable, which is interesting. <laughs> and then uh, we'd try to predict all the races. And you know what? Pretty good at calling them. <laughs> Even before any mail's been sent, before they've campaigned, um, you can kind of tell. The more likable person usually wins. It isn't the issues that decides those races. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, why are we not being principled? We'll try to right. pick good candidates that are likable mm -hmm. in principle. Yeah. And we can win. If you look in Texas, by the way, it's interesting. All the races where we took primaries with more conservative Republicans 
are the swing districts mm. that are more liberal overall. The rural districts, we're having a hard time flipping. Interesting. So the rural districts will elect liberal Republicans. The swing districts like mine, like Ron Simmons, um, you know, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you know, we've done well in primaries electing conservatives. Mm. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It is interesting yeah. indeed how people actually, um, like what the swing areas are the ones that will actually get a conservative in versus the areas that are more, you know, Classic. I mean, look at Congress. Who's the, who's the most conservative congressman from Texas right now? Chip right. Roy. Yeah. His district's one of the closest right. ones. Is, <laughs> yeah. And it's been Austin to have yeah. him there. Uh, he was at Ali Stuckey's, the testimony that he was at, or she was at. Oh. Mm-hmm. It was nice to hear him, you know, protecting um, a fellow Texan. But, um, well, thank you so much, uh, Matt, for joining us. Um and what are you, what are you doing next? Like what are you or what are you doing now? I know you have a, a cute little little one, which I don't know how little uh, he is right now. Two years oh, old. Okay, Aww. so all right, so then you're really about to feel the terrible threes, whatever it is. <laughs> the next, terrible right? threes. Terrible, the terrible twos. Yeah. Terrible twos. Yeah, terrible twos. yeah. probably yeah. a rascal. Um. Right. <laughs> but super cute. Um, but yeah, what what's um, up for you next? What are you doing next? Are you uh, starting your whole news outlet like Connie Burton or like what what's what's up for you next? I'm, I'm try, I've been I've been writing articles and doing podcasts and joining up with Stickland to do some of that. Um, you know, just trying to stay active in the movement like I did before I was an elected official. I mean, I do care about the issues, so I'm trying to stay involved and do what I can. And you know, I'd love to run for office again if if that's if I can be of any good, and you know, if that's where my life takes me, uh, I'd love to do it. Right. Well, it's obvious, I would say, especially now with so many people um, deciding not to run again um, in the House, the Texas House, uh, that we need some good conservatives there. So I don't know. Maybe, you know I agree. To that. Um, I would love to vote for you if I were back in Texas. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, um, <laughs> we would vote for you if we could. But yes. even Antonia now <laughs> is uh, going to help us get some good um, Colorado legislators in because we That's need true. those too. Um, Absolutely. They're a hot mess. We do. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and Texans are moving here too. So yeah, but uh, um, I would certainly be happy to see you um, back in politics in Texas. Um, I think that you would be a good voice uh, for Texas to have um, back in a position where you actually have some power over what's going on too. So um, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So where can people uh, follow you? Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter or Facebook at Matt Rinaldi TX. Uh, for either one awesome. of them. Awesome. Yeah. We'll go give um, Matt a follow. Um, and thank you so much again for your time tonight and for your insight on all of these issues. Um, Texas is an important state for us to pay mm-hmm. attention to with the Second Amendment. So um, we always like to hear that perspective. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of our audience who were asking questions and participating in the live chat. Um, yeah, we we are able to actually read it live now. So um, yeah, the honest Jew, <laughs> the I'm honest Jew. Thank you for your questions. All of your comments. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you were like, Tony is anti-Semitic or something. She's always picking on the honest Jew. Okay, it's because he picked on me first. That's the only reason why I'm doing that. Um, was that the individual who said that Edgar was yeah, the best person? really yeah. likes Edgar. Don't know why. I'm just, I don't know. So um, they're saying because that. Because he's sane and he's intelligent <laughs> and he's honest. Oh, okay. All right. Get we'll out see. of here with that. We'll Edgar. see. We'll Get see about that. that. Uh, uh, although yeah. I'm sure he is sane and honest and all those yeah. things because oh, yeah. he watches the podcast regardless. So that is true. We do know, appreciate. I, we that can't. Loyalty. We can't be hating on our on our viewers. <laughs> it's not a good. It's not a good call. Um, and the honest Jew says Matt should go on the Ben Shapiro show. Um, I mean, if oh, Ben nice. Shapiro would like to have him on, I think that would be good. Um, you know, Ben Shapiro should have Antonia on. Also, um, <laughs> well, you can't mention me. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna pl- uh, yeah. I'm gonna plug Antonio whenever someone says stuff like that. Um, oh, there's yeah. What are people saying here? Uh, they're rooting. They're really excited that we talked about you know the honest Jew. 
really, not, we're, we're, we're creating a hero here, guys. Uh, okay, it's time to unplug this okay, <laughs> before he gain, can gain more popularity. Um, uh, let's see. And we <laughs> we do have, I was trying to read it from the story away, but I'm blind. Oh, so okay. let's see. Uh, DDS214 says, not saying this is a good idea or should be done, but why isn't violating people's constitutional rights a crime? Because that's what people are doing when they pass laws violating 2A. Um, hmm. Well, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of tough. Like, it, would it be, like, who are you going to prosecute for that? And who's going to do the prosecuting? Isn't that what the Second Amendment is about, though? Because if you get to the point where there's too much violation of the Second Amendment or the Constitution, then we... We have the be, guns. Be, we beat that ass. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, pretty much, right? Let's. So wouldn't that be the consequence is we just shoot them? <laughs> I mean, if they if they were actually we getting to that point, right? Like that's... Um, was it Thomas Jefferson? I always forget which founding father said that the Second Amendment is only, um, you know, it's pretty much only there for when it gets attacked because, you know, pretty it's it's just going to be the sleeping amendment, so to speak, until people try to take guns away, and then that's when it'll matter. And then when they do, we'll all have the guns, so they won't be able to take them away. Like that's kind, of, you know, it's like the the whole point of it is to prevent the violation of it as well. Like it's kind of a self fulfilling thing. Um, and I gotta say, even if, I mean, there probably would be a lot of people who would comply, but I still stand by that if they pass some kind of federal gun confiscation thing, it would be like in New Zealand where, you people know, would... the vast majority of people didn't comply with it. Right, right. And then it might get like they might try to enforce it, but that's when you would start having like there. A lot of people probably would have cops kick in their door and give up their guns, but there would be some people who wouldn't who wouldn't put up with that. And then, you know, that's when we have like Civil War 2.0 and all that kind of mess. So I still think th like the Second Amendment is there for us to be able to defend the Second Amendment. <laughs> 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 like it's kind of silly. But I mean, it's it's true. It's pretty simple. Self-fulfilling um, stuff. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think it's Monique or is it? Yeah. Is it Monique? Monique. And Monique. And I was like, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate you following me after the Prager U video. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you guys. And then DD. Oh, you already said that one. Um, and then Mark Michael Lewis says the politicians that write the legislation who are sworn to protect the Constitution. And that, I was just going to say the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. that's the thing. We are we are supposed to have lawmakers that are only there to protect our rights. Right. That's it. It, it really shouldn't be Democrat, Republican, because that's that's their jurisdiction, if you will. That That's all they need to be doing. We're mm -hmm. a constitutional republic. Um, and the whole, uh, you know, what are we, a, Republ a republic, if you can keep it, that whole, that whole, uh, banter between benjamin franklin and, and someone else which i don't know if everyone anyone has actually said that actually happened but if not whatever it doesn't matter mm -hmm. um i do really feel like right now it is a republic if you can keep it right and i don't think we're we're, we're not keeping it and yeah also we haven't done a good job our with tolerance that. level like we were saying was a declaration of independence like a lot more things were, a lot less things were happening at that time and they had a revolution and we're just like, yeah. well, I hope the next session, like, be kind of like a, a on the red side. You know, um... Like, the amount of taxes <laughs> that they were subject to that drove right. them to have a revolution was like a fraction of what we pay right now. Um, right. It's crazy. Um, oh, it is Monique. My bad. My bad. Um, <laughs> okay, and let's see. Uh, can't we prosecute people who violate our lives our, our lives by enacting unconstitutional laws before we have to shoot them. I mean, the issue is that, like, where are prosecutors at? I mean, obviously, there's a problem in terms of, like, whether it actually is a crime to be a politician who votes yes on something that is unconstitutional, right? Because we've gone down this whole rabbit hole of only the Supreme Court can decide what's constitutional or right. not, um, which I don't think should be the case, but that's a whole other legal discussion that I'm not going to get into. But um, part of the problem is, too, like, personally, I think, and oh, I shouldn't say stuff like this because I'm someday I'm just going to get screwed by the federal <laughs> government, but, like, our prosecutors don't prosecute their own kind you know like the co congressmen there's so many 
instances of just outright bribery that happens in Congress all the time. Where are the prosecutors at? They're not doing anything. We have all of these unconstitutional wars being fought. We have the president, not just Trump, but all of the previous presidents, pretty much going back to um, Kennedy, you know, violating their oath of office, or not oath of office, but in terms of um, going over the powers that Mm -hmm. they should have, you know, doing stuff via executive order that presidents should not be doing. Um, But no one's getting prosecuted for war crimes. No one's getting prosecuted for bribery. You know, all of this stuff just gets... Uh, tossed by the wayside not to mention all these companies that were responsible for um at least partially responsible for the housing bubble Mm -hmm. they got to all just get out of that stuff with what's called a deferred prosecution agreement which basically lets companies buy their way out of criminal prosecution that's a real thing um and i'm just it's like we just can't trust our prosecutors to actually do anything right now unfortunately they're they've really been derelict in their duties in my opinion and that's why i'm saying Eventually, the federal government's going to bring the hammer down on me. Like, some federal prosecutor <laughs> probably heard this and is like, what <laughs> dirt can we get on Nina? But um, really, I think that they, if I had the Constitution to be the kind of person who could prosecute people, I would get into that because I do think that it's at the root of a lot of our problems in terms of mm. government accountability. Because we, it's federal prosecutors who can prosecute Congress people, but they're all they're all patting each other on the back and you right. know cushioning each other's pockets. They don't mm. they don't care. So um, yeah, that's the problem. Who who legislates the legislators? Fair point. Yeah, ex- yeah. That, it's just it's unfortunate. Um, I do think there was a time when prosecutors had a little bit more, you know, cojones. And you, if you think about like the Nuremberg trials, you know, those were people who said we're going to bring mm. war criminals to justice and we're going to make them go through a trial and all of that. But there's just none of that. They're just like, oh, well, we just trust we trust the government. We'll do all of these wild goose chase investigations, like all this Russia stuff. But, you know, all of the bribery and corruption that's happening in Congress, like we'll just we'll just pretend that that's not happening. Um and so that was a long answer to your question, but it's something I'm very passionate about, actually. And um, if I didn't think that it would ruin my future uh, ability to not be in prison, I would probably write <laughs> legal papers about the problem with our prosecutors. But it's just going to um, it's going to get me in trouble. So <laughs> Yeah, man. I always want to, like, end with that when you do your, like, your Nina, like... <laughs> my, like, <laughs> rant. Nina I always rant. have I love one. it. <laughs> Someone on my channel did say, like, I love a good Nina rant in, in yes, the comments one Apple, time. Yes, Apple, the whole iPhone. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. That, that was a good rant, Up too. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you have any thoughts on that or on those particular issues? By the way, I know I, I went off on a rant. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're honest. <laughs> um, well, um, thank you all so much for tuning in tonight, yes. Ben. Um, if you want to support this podcast, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Um, we're Trigger Warning 2A Podcast on there. Um, we also have a, a Bitcoin wallet or, um, mm-hmm. you know, a, why can't I think of uh, the right? Ah. Collect. Why can't I think of? Coin? No, I mean, like, what's the more general term for c- cryptocurrency? Sorry. Um, and it's, yeah, we can accept not just Bitcoin, but other crypto too into our wallet. So sorry, that was me having like a Monday night um, brain problem. Um, but yeah, and that'll be at least on my channel. Um, I'll have it in the description. We also have a physical address in case you want to donate um, via physical um, mailings or something like that. I know a lot of people don't like Patreon. You might not use crypto. So we have a physical address that will be on my page too. Um, And I don't know if you want to talk about Governors of America. Yeah. So I have a a pretty big announcement coming up in regards to Governors of America next week. Um, But I think I just got that you're probably not even telling me that you're totally totally (laughs) something else. (laughs) Um, I was. Anyways, uh, well, <laughs> all right, just, just cut it, just cut it. I'm sorry. Uh, so, and the, for those who want to join GOA, uh, mm-hmm. you guys can go to the link that we can provide, or if not, you can go to GOA and just search Antonio Okafor. You get a special 25% off uh, discount um, off of your membership. So if you guys want to become a GOA member, uh, go through that. And mm-hmm. um, we ha- are very, very um, thankful for gun owners, gun owners, for guns, ah, 
Guns for everyone. Goodness, tonight is crazy. We're both having yeah. some late yeah. night moments. Oh happening. my goodness. Guns for everyone. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. Edgar, you're amazing. Um, mm-hmm. you know, for concealed carry classes, you can buy a gun. Um, there's so many different, you know, they have a lot of different training. So make sure you guys check that out. Guns for everyone in Reet Ridge and in Thornton. Mm-hmm. So yeah. But thank you guys so much for joining us. It was a really active and lively chat. I really appreciate that. Um We'll be back next Monday um, mm-hmm. at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time. So, again, um, thanks for joining us. My name is Antonia Okafor. And I'm Nina Prevo. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye.